Three minutes after 10 is the time. A very good morning to you. Um, let's dive straight in on this one. It, it, well, actually, no. Let's dance around a little bit first and, and, and make some airy-fairy observations and, and speculations. It, it, there's, there's two worlds, isn't there? And I mean, you know that the value of the pound or how the pound performs against other currencies is important. Partly because people keep telling you that it is and, and, you know, it affects how much spending power you have when you go on holiday. I'm thinking about normal people like us, people who don't make killings one way or the other on currency fluctuations and don't completely understand what they are. I've never really been embarrassed by that ignorance because, you know, life's too short. You can't, you can't be an expert on everything. But at times like this, it is a little bit embarrassing how few of us actually understand what's going on. I'll give you an indication of, of Brexit Britain. There is a man who used to have quasi quarting on his payroll as, as a sort of advisor and who has also spent time married to one of Rupert Murdoch's daughters who reportedly made millions and millions of pounds when the pound went off a cliff on Friday, shortly after the current chief secretary to the Treasury, a chap called Chris Philp, had tweeted um, how good it was to see the pound performing so well in response to Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget. I, I mean, there was, a, I think, a tiny, tiny little upward movement, and then, I mean, a bit like a bit like hopping on one leg before falling off a cliff, is what happened to the pound on Friday, and, and things have only got worse this morning. What they're doing now is claiming that they're not allowed to talk about the pound. <clears throat> That's how dishonest everything has become now. So on Friday, this fellow is free to tweet when it looked for about three quarters of a second, it looked as if the pound was going to respond positively to Kwarteng's mini-budget. This chap is allowed to tweet about, what well, that, that's great news. Oh, that's really good to see. I should really have got the tweet up in front of me, shouldn't I, so that you could hear verbatim what, what we're talking about. Um, fast forward li literally 10 seconds, pound goes off a cliff, and now they're all queuing up to tell you they're not allowed to comment or they're not able to comment on currency fluctuations. Maybe there's a precedent there, but if there is, then it's one that Chris Philp, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, the chief secretary to the treasury, so utterly detached from reality that he apparently either didn't understand or failed to see what was so obvious to that bloke who used to be married to Rupert Murdoch's daughter and give Kwasi Kwarteng, um, have Kwasi Kwarteng on his payroll as some sort of advisor. He could see clearly enough what was happening to make millions of pounds from betting on it, but the chief secretary to the treasury honestly thought that it was going to go in the opposite direction. No, flipping it. His name is Philp, not Filth. I did not call the Chief Secretary to the Treasury Chris Filth in response to that text that's just come in. Um, and that's part of the problem, isn't it? Part of the problem is that we sort of think we'll leave this stuff to the grown-ups, or at least I do, and I don't think I'm unique like that. There, there is a sense that, that, that lots of people understand, the people who understand this, type, oh, it's all okay, They've, the grown-ups will see us through. The same bloke, his name is Crispin Odie. He made a ton of money uh, in the immediate aftermath of Brexit when the pound tanked after Brexit as well. I, I mean, I don't understand the satisfaction. I, I know, obviously, I understand the satisfaction in having an awful lot of money pouring into your coffers. I think we all carry. I did see the Euro Millions win at the end of last week of £171 million. Or... Uh, uh, well, I, I was about to try and translate it into dollars, but I think those jokes will wait. So you, you, you expect the grown-ups somehow to be in charge of it. You don't quite, or you can't quite get your head around the idea that people are, are making fortunes, betting against their own country, betting against their own country's currency. And these people are at the very heart of the Conservative Party, either through donations or, or even membership. I sound so naive today to you. I know I do. I, 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 I thought it would get better as I got older. I thought I'd get less naive. But I, I actually find it really, really gross. I, I, even Margaret Thatcher, I don't know if you knew this, I only learnt it at the weekend. Even Margaret Thatcher tried to find some way of curbing currency speculators. The, the current Conservative government is in bed with them. I, I, not consciously, I'm sure. That would be even too much. I'm sounding naive again, aren't I? But the Simple fact is that the pound reached its lowest level ever against the dollar earlier this morning. Ever. And as far as I understand it, this is in response 
to Kwasi Kwarteng's tax cuts and the news that he's going to borrow billions and billions and billions of pounds to essentially give us tax cuts, to plug the holes opened up by letting the richest people in the country keep a lot more of their income than they currently do. The markets have run for the hills. And then at the weekend, he appeared on television suggesting that he was going to do even more. And you know the days where we sit here? What's the analogy I use? The, the magic eye analogy where you stare at this picture. It's from the 1980s. So apologies to younger listeners. There used to be these things called um, magic eye. And they were optical illusions. They were sort of fairly confused pictures of nothing much in particular, a bunch of ju jumbled up shapes. But if you stared at it in the right way, if you got your eyes focused on the right spot, then an image would emerge like a steam train or a lion or something like that. And I often feel like that about the news or about politics in particular. You see politicians doing something. So the pound hit the lowest level against the dollar it has ever been. And the front page of the Daily Mail today, which is sort of increasingly the house journal for this brand of conservatives, they've even, they even seem to have lost the telegraph which is an incredible achievement, really. But the front page of the Daily Mail is Kwasi's boost for families. Kwasi Kwarteng is drawing up plans for a fresh round of tax cuts to help families struggling with the cost of living. Um, in a combative interview yesterday, the Chancellor brushed aside market jitters. Market jitters? The, the pound has never been lower against the dollar. Market jitters? Really? Okay, maybe. Phone lines are open. 03456060973 is the number you need. They talk about growth, but they have taken us out of the largest free trade area in the history of humanity. They have erected barriers to trade. They have made trading harder. They have turned us into the only country in the history of our species to actually impose economic sanctions on itself. But they talk about growth. They talk about magic money trees and, and Labour's fiscal irresponsibility 12 years after taking power as they prepare to borrow on an unprecedented scale in order to essentially <laughs> funnel money towards the people most likely to vote for them, the people already in possession of the greatest incomes in the country. I said it on Friday and I'll say it again. The idea that this government have just given me thousands of pounds back while they've done next to nothing for a nurse or a teacher, a firefighter, a police officer, where you pick, pick your favourite member of the public sector, is absolutely unthinkable. It's unthinkable, but they've done it, and they're boasting about how they're going to do it more. So you watch the pound plummet for reasons that most people agree are linked to the announcements on Friday, and Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, says that there's more of the same to come. Now you get it, right? Now you see the magic eye argument that I'm making, because there it is. So either he thinks, and this is where you're going to join me in a moment in speculating about what's going on in the world, not on the currency. Um, you're going to join me a, in a moment in speculating about whether or not he has a plan. Oh, we're back there again, aren't we? We're back there again. Do you remember at the beginning of COVID where we thought maybe there's a plan? They're just not telling us. We now know there was no plan at all, but it was so... It was so clumsy. It was so cack-handed. Those, those early days when he didn't turn up to the Cobra meetings and he didn't, there was no clarity and no leadership. And that it, was, it was almost reassuring to think that Dominic Cummings, we all thought Dominic Cummings has got some sinister master plan and there is actually something going on behind the scenes. They can't really just be making it up as they go along and, uh, and, and ducking their responsibilities and crossing their fingers and closing their eyes and just hoping that it would all go away. Is there a sinister master plan? I'm back there again now with Kwasi Kwarteng. Does he have a rationale for believing that what has happened to the pound since Friday is a good thing, a desirable thing, or even merely a necessary evil? Is, is there a rationale there? Or are they just dancing? Are they just dancing as, as, on the Titanic, pretending that everything's fine? Or... Or, or hoping that the that three melons are going to unexpectedly pop up on the fruit machine of the British economy and coins will start pouring out the bottom. I don't really understand what the gamble is, to be honest with you. Although everybody agrees that there has been an epic gamble, a profoundly reckless one, according to a full-page article in the Daily Telegraph today. 
So, I, I, I mean, we do occasionally allow a touch of Marvin Gaye to creep into the production process on this program. I, I, I am going to ask you what's going on. But from any angle you want, I, I mean, by all means, school me on or, or educate all of us on the significance of this plummeting pound. I suppose for what you might describe as patriotic reasons, I'd quite like to hear some rational analysis suggesting that things aren't quite as bad as many people suggest. You have American economic uh, economists describing us now in, in terms that are normally used for third world countries. And it, 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 behaving like an emerging economy that's keen to become a submerging economy, I think one of them said, former chief secretary in the United States. Uh, you know that our newspapers have abandoned any semblance, or some of them have. They've abandoned any semblance of objectivity. The, the, the idea that there is something to celebrate in today's fiscal news is, is beyond belief, actually. It is, it is North Korean in its content and its concept. But it's not, I think, embarrassing to say. I, I, I don't know how bad things actually are. I don't know how bad this actually is. I don't know how important this actually is. Uh, I saw one newspaper yesterday trying to line up for and against. And on the four sides, you had Nigel Farage and a bloke from the Institute of Economic Affairs. That, 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 that was who they found on the four side. And then on the against side, you've got like American former chief secretaries to the Treasury. Uh, I think Ken Clark. Former Conservative Chancellor, I think I may I may have misremembered that. Don't don't quote me on that one. But that just speaks to the idea that this is only appealing to people who either don't know what they're talking about or don't ever tell you who's paying their wages. And how big a surprise would it be if the wages of some of these think tanks were being paid by precisely the sort of people who make millions and millions and millions of pounds when politicians introduce policies such as the ones we saw on Friday. Um, I, I, I am naive. I, I don't apologise to you for that. Gareth uses the C word already this morning, corruption. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't believe that can happen here, still. I, and I, oh, you can tell from my voice I'm really struggling to hang on to it. The idea that we are better than that. You know the people that claim that people like us are the ones that aren't patriotic. We're talking the country. You sit here feeling genuine despair. At what appeals to be, what appears to be, at the very least, abject incompetence, and at the very worst, something rather uglier than incompetence. I can't see a third choice. And you sit here clinging to the hope that it's abject incompetence, because the alternative, as somebody who is patriotic, somebody who uses the word patriotic to describe a deep and abiding concern for his fellow citizens, not necessarily for flags or statues or or National Trust notice boards, but for people, humans, flesh and blood, facing all manner of privations and problems at the moment. But the patriotic people are the ones that have tanked the pound and made millions of pounds doing so? What's happened to us? So that's why I'm not sorry for being naive. The alternative is too bleak. What's going on? What does this mean? What happens next? Nobody knows for sure. That's the point, isn't it? Nobody knows for sure. The more confident you can appear in some contexts, the more likely you are to get elected to high office, given the state this country is in at the moment. Or indeed the, um, the media. Nobody knows. It seems to me, from what I've read, and I'm not stupid, well, all right, we can, we can leave the jury out on that one, but I've got a degree from the London School of Economics, and it seems to me that that we're about to see the Bank of England try to minimise the negative impacts of the Chancellor of the Exchequer's policies, which is just incredible. And if there are any echoes here of what happened in 1974 when Anthony Barber was Chancellor, they're going to have to, they're going to have to hit the reverse pedal. They're going to have to U-turn on it quicker than I think even Boris Johnson. No, Boris Johnson sometimes U-turned before he'd even faced in the right direction. He was sometimes doing a U-turn before the minute he got into the car, like a donut, as I believe the kids call them. So that that's just not normal. It's not normal. Maybe if I wasn't so naive, I'd be using stronger words, possibly even the C word, but it's not normal. And of course, as the gilts go up, the amount of interest we pay on the money that we borrowed goes up. I say, of course, I think that's what it means. I think that's what's going on. All of the money that he borrowed on Friday or announced that he was going to borrow on Friday by Monday is going to cost 
considerably more. So he's impoverished an indebted nation even more than it was already by simply announcing that he was going to borrow money in order to give tax cuts to people like me. That's, look, I, I can't get stuck on this. There's other stuff in that announcement. But just in terms of politics, optics and priorities, the fact that they've given thousands of pounds to me <sighs> seems just wrong. It seems immoral, actually. 10.18 is the time. I, I could go on for hours, actually. I mean, that strange hinterland, that liminal space where the more I talk about it, the more reassured I feel. Um, it's not actually working very well today, but there are, there are modicums of improvement. 0345 6060 James O'Brien doesn't want to believe that our government is corrupt. I feel compassion for him and contempt for the con men. Yeah. Hey, two things. You know something's afoot when people are quoting your own catchphrases back at you. And I'll tell you something else, Matt, as well. The Daily Mail comment section this weekend contained a couple of contributors suggesting that people needed to listen to me to understand what was really going on. The Daily Mail comment, when, when I start appearing in the Daily Mail comment section as a trusted source, I think it might be the end of times. 22 minutes after 10 is the time. What does it all mean? Okay, and there's no uh, faux ignorance or innocence from me on this. I, I, I'm quite open about that. I, I, I understand some of it. I don't understand a lot of it. 0345 6060 is the number that you need. 23 minutes after 10 is the time. William can kick things off in Redgrave in Suffolk. William, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How are you doing? All right. good. Confused. Okay. I'll try and make this as simple as I can. OK, I'm 62, semi-retired for various reasons to do with looking after family, etc., etc. Sure. I had a reasonable job. I have a personal pension fund. Working part-time at the moment means that the tax cut and the um, airline thing doesn't make any difference to me because I don't right. have enough money to benefit from that. But that's, an, that's, that's an aside. Okay. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so I have a personal pension fund. I never had a company pension fund because I worked as a sort of, uh, for various companies doing a technical sales job. So I accrued a pension fund. At 60, I had to monetize that fund, which meant it had to go into stocks and shares. Right. right? Now, under normal circumstances, you're saying, how does the pound fluctuating affect the average person? Right? This yeah. is exactly what happened. Okay? Yeah, that's what I, I want. I had a pension fund of about £300,000. Some people might think that's a lot, but that's kind of got to last the rest of my life. Yeah? Sort of like, yeah? Yes. Um, I, might, I might have to go back to work. But anyway, it's but, um, full time. But anyway, so three hundred thousand pounds. Okay. Now you should expect that to make you, in an average market, you know, sort of if you're on a good bad year, ten thousand pounds. On a good year, fifteen, maybe almost, yeah, just yeah. fifteen, eighteen thousand okay. pounds, something like that. Okay. In reality, um, since in, in the last three months, I've lost those five thousand pounds. And that was and, before Friday. No, actually, uh, 35,000, well, I lost 20,000, 20, just over 20,000 up until Friday. Right. Since Friday, I've lost another 12. So 35 in total. So that, so so that means your capital sum is going down, which means moving forward, even when things get back to normal, you'll be living off the interest from a smaller sum or, or, or from yeah, the dividends. Or, or, I've got, or, I've, or I've got to wait for the market to turn around to again. Like, to turn around I'm sorry, think. obviously, for your for your personal situation, and I, and I understand uh, even okay. if some people don't why three hundred thousand pounds is not a particularly mighty nest egg in the context of of, of what you describe. Can, do you want to have a crack at explaining why that's happened? And and don't well, worry I mean, about being too simplistic or thinking that you'll stay in the bleeding obvious. I I, I I think we need to really start right from the bottom this okay. morning. Okay. Well, the, the one thing I want to say there is I don't think I'm in an unusual position. No, you I won't think be. There's thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in exactly the same place as me who haven't got company pensions but have actually invested themselves in their own private pension. Right. Combination, three things, Brexit, Ukraine and current policies. Yeah. That's it. Right, yeah. so Ukraine, it, it, we're doing yeah, the right absolutely. thing. That's the price we pay for, for, for standing up to tyrants. Brexit, yeah. just madness. Absolute yeah. madness. Yeah. Bre Brexit, madness, and... Current um, policies? What well, I mean, I, again, I, I really don't want to be the bloke that keeps asking this throughout the morning, but is it possible that Kwasi Kwarteng actually knows what he's doing? And, and, no. And, no. No, <laughs> absolutely. 
absolutely not. You know, trickle downs never work. It's just a load of rubbish. Well, they deny I mean, it exists. They tell me it doesn't exist, trickle down. And then quite what the rationale is behind giving a ton of money to the richest people in the country if they're simultaneously claiming that trickle-down economics isn't a real thing and doesn't exist. That has got me completely bamboozled. But he must have a... Pl- he must think... In his, we took one call on Friday from someone who explained that the tax scenario meant that if his business was looking at where they were going to cut jobs, they might put Britain near the back of the queue. Uh, uh, in other words, they might be looking at burdens in other countries and deciding to to cut their French or their German workforce. That was the closest we got to a scintilla of optimism. Can we build on that at all together? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think it's all fairly negative at the moment. I mean, well, at least you've still got your sense of humour. At least you've still got your sense of humour. I was talking to a German colleague who used to work for the Germans over the weekend and... Yeah. and, and uh, and he's saying about, you know, it's interesting about the bankers. Yeah, of course, they all are all going to Frankfurt and Amsterdam yes. and places uh, like that. Uh, because they can and they, they want to. Yeah. yeah? Oh, all right. Well, and, 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 and one little last comment. Yeah, go on which, quickly. You know, yeah, I'm a Labour person. Hands up. Yeah. So, sure. yeah. Um, but, you know, Rachel Reeves is talking about taxing pensions. Yeah. yeah? Now, yeah. If they're going to tax my dividend on right, a pension. Right, very quickly, because I'm only really right, interested quickly, in, in what's right, actually okay. happening right, now. Okay. All I'm saying is, if, if they're going to put a 5% tax on any profit I make on my pension, am I going to get a rebate for the 35 grand I lost? That's all I'm going to say. I, I hear you. I, I hear you, because you didn't, cause you, yeah, you're, getting, you're not getting a rebate when you lose money, so how can you be expected to pay a tax when you gain it? I understand the logic behind your inquiry. Thank you, William. Um, <sighs> Ali's in Kidlington. Ali, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Uh, yeah, it, it just reminds me of um, a quote from James Carville. He used to be um, Clinton's advisor that if he could come back, he'd come back as a bond market yeah. um, because of the pressure the markets put on um, government policy and quasi quartet. I mean, to brush the market's reaction off sort of flippantly at the weekend. I mean, this guy... 1.08, I think, he, I think now, possibly even lower. So, you know, a pound for a dollar is, is well within sight, isn't it? Well, his thinking is that you know if foreign foreign countries will start buying up you know investing in the UK to mergers and acquisitions and all that kind of thing, but that's not going to have the kind of response to growth in the time. So he what's wants the it to thing? Happen. Yeah, well, also they're going to buy stuff. They're not going to invest necessarily. There was that company ARM, the chip company that they came in for. Yeah. The Japanese came um, in for shortly after Brexit. That's listing in New York this morning, ironically enough. So that's no longer a British company, I don't think. So uh, and, and James, the other point is. Um, yeah, I mean, these things take time to happen. I mean, it doesn't well, what, happen what takes time to happen? People, people around the world, international business people, yeah. are going to be looking at us. There is one currency in the world currently performing worse <laughs> than the pound. It's in Madagascar. They're going to be looking yeah. at us and thinking, "Crikey, let's have a bit of that, lads." I just don't get that, that bit of the argument. Do you? That, that, no, no, I don't. And that's why we need a general election. I've got a small, a young family, and this guy, I don't want him anywhere near. Uh, fiscal and monetary policy. And the other thing as well, which has been overlooked, the governor of the Bank of England has been behind the curve as well. So the market is losing confidence in the UK. That is a serious thing. Um, And that means all the money that we borrow costs a hell of a lot more than it would have done before they lost confidence in the UK. Thank you, Ali. Uh, It's it's just gone half past ten. A couple of phone lines free if you've um, got something to add to this. And don't hold back. Uh, Don't be embarrassed by your innocence or even ignorance is a word I'd use to describe my own position because I think they bank on that in a way they kind of exploit that the idea that we think the grown-ups will sort it out you've seen what happens Boris Johnson was in charge of this country for three years Boris Johnson a, a man whose name is a synonym for carelessness and incompetence there is no uh uh, mileage anymore in the notion that somehow the sensible ones rise to the top. Liz Truss changes her mind about everything six times before breakfast. And then when she finally settles on a position, she pursues it with such furious single-mindedness that it excludes all sanity, it sometimes seems. There is no mileage in the notion that the sensible people will somehow rise to the top. I think there used to be, and I pray there will be again, but not anymore. The question, what the hell is going on, has never been more urgent or important. Holly Harris is here now with the headlines. It is 10.35. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I suppose 
what what would success look like? It's one of my favourite questions. That actually, um, it sometimes takes politicians by surprise. What would success look like? And they, they're not they're not quite sure because they're too caught up in the weeds, too caught up in the toing and froing. What would success look like? Growth. It's quite a catch-all term, isn't it? And we've just heard that growth forecasts are now being downgraded as a consequence, partly as a consequence, certainly in after Friday's announcements. So what, what would quasi quasi I tell you, it's weird, but the bit that really frightened me was the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, a chap called Chris Philp, tweeting very early doors on Friday about how it was great to see the pound responding so positively to Kwasi Kwarteng's announcements, because that suggested to me that that's what they were expecting. Here it is. Great to see sterling strengthening on the back of the new UK growth plan. That was 10.17 a.m. on Friday. So, so that was while Rachel Reeves was still delivering her response, to, wasn't it? Do you remember we came on? Didn't, didn't Nick hand over to me halfway through? Was that, on, that was on Friday. God, it feels like a lifetime ago. So while Rachel, this is while Rachel Rees was still on her feet in the House of Commons, the actual Chief Secretary to the Treasury tweeted, great to see sterling strengthening on the back of the new UK growth plan. From pretty much that point forward, it's been heading in an entirely downward direction to a level that has never actually been seen before. So if the Chief Secretary to the Treasury was expecting and trumpeting movement upwards, the fact that the movement downwards has been so complete and so catastrophic is terrifying because it means the people who have, if you like, programmed the computer, no, the people who have built the car thought that by now it would be going at 100 miles an hour, but in fact the wheels have just fallen off. And they built it, and they're still in charge. And now they're saying, Chloe Smith, who I think is part of the Treasury team as well, saying this morning that she can't comment. Obviously, I can't comment on market movements. But 72 hours ago, one of her bosses was saying, great to see sterling strengthening on the back of the new UK growth plan. You scared yet? Jaunty's in St. John's Wood. Jaunty, what have you got? Hi, James. Yeah, they're saying that quasi Quarton is gambling. But normally with gambling, you're taking a very high risk for a very high return. I think he's taking a very high risk, and I don't think there's much of a return at all. And the maths bear this out. Go on. So, so this is actually, you're, you're having a crack at what would success look like? Uh, no, I'm having a crack at this is not going to be successful at all. No, I know. That, words, that's Even if it works, it's still not going to be very impressive. But you're going to tell us what it would uh, look exactly, like if it worked. Exactly. Go on, so here's, the, here's the math. Take a, imagine you've got a bathtub and you're filling it up with water, which means economy growing. Yes. And then at times you take out the plug, which means economy contracting. Yes. Right? You've got £45 billion pounds worth of fiscal revenue changes, in other words, the tax changes, right? Now, you have something in economics called the multiplier effect, which is quite hard to estimate. But even on a bullish day, 0.5 is about as high as it's going to go, especially as you've got, for example, if you take the top rate of tax pay, going to save some, or she's going to save some. Uh, it's going to go in, in imports, which doesn't go into the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So 0.5 is about as high as it's going to go. So that's a growth of 22.5 and a half, half billion, half of 45, right? Yeah. Then you go to interest rates, right? We know the Bank of England is going to have to put interest rates up to compensate for the inflationary impact of fiscal changes. Yes. Every 1% increase in interest rates takes out 8 billion from that growth. So just 1%, which is quite modest, and we're down to 14 and a half billion growth. It's 14 and a half billion. Then you take into account how many mortgages flip from fixed to variable. Mm. Every 2% of those will impact another billion the wrong way. Yeah. Where do you get these uh, numbers from, if you don't mind me asking? I, I did all the maths this morning. You just, you, you can, if, you, if you know how, to, how, how it all works, okay. you just do about 10 Google searches and do the maths on a, cool. on a calculator. Yeah. This is the kind of modelling that the Treasury... I suspect there are people in the Treasury having heart attacks because well, this they're is the key. the model and going, at best, on a $2.5 trillion so uh, what, pound what? economy... Hang on, James. Right, on I'm a $2.5 hanging, trillion dollar economy, you're unlikely to produce more than 0.2% of the growth from high-risk situation. If the multiplier effect is 0.3, which is highly likely, you might even go into negative territory. So what do you think Kwarteng thinks success looks like? Well, Given that, I mean, you know, you're a top man, John T, but you can't have just discovered these calculations. There must be people doing 
the same sums and getting different answers, mustn't there? Chief, no, chief think, among well, whom would be quasi Quarte. No, I, I think what it is, the guy, you know, so you've got to have the big picture in your head. Okay, doesn't matter how many people advise you of this, that, and the other from the Treasury. If you've got an ideology running around the head, in your head yeah. and you don't know much about economics, <clears throat> you can kind of convince yourself of anything. So I let me read you do. something to that end from a from a, a, someone called Julian Jessup, who is inevitably yeah. linked to the IEA, speaking to The Spectator three weeks ago. If tax cuts do mean more borrowing in the short term, I'm completely relaxed about that. I suspect yeah. the markets will be as well. Right, right. Uh, he, the guy studied classics. Um, I don't think there's much economic com- competence in the top brass of the government. And I think they're hooked on an ideology. And So that's it. They've, they've got almost a, a Kool-Aid where they think that uh, we cut, yeah. tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts is the real answer. So they do somewhere inside themselves, in the same way that some people believe in the tooth fairy or unicorns, they do somehow believe inside that this will increase the overall tax take. They're not quite as vampiric and callous as some characterizations portray them as. They do honestly believe, but it is like believing in the tooth fairy. Yes. But but, oh but the uh, there's a 40-page report on the internet as to what the government announced. From the uh, IFS? Yeah. yeah. Most yeah. of it's not reported because everybody's hung up on the fiscal changes, which sure. is understandable. Yes. And there are some good things, like, for example, the immigration stuff, which is amazingly not very Brexit. Yes. Um, or not very Brexit if you voted Brexit for immigration reasons, anyhow, um, is actually exactly the right thing. They're doing exactly the right thing there because... Well, they're, no, the, they're trying to do exactly the right yeah. thing, but people like Suella Braverman and Kemi Badenoch are already clutching their pearls and screaming objections to it. I mean, that's one of the front pages today. We're getting onto it a little later yeah. in the programme as it's the first big cabinet split is on the need to fill these jobs that have been vacated by people mm. who, when we told them to F off back to where they came from, guess what? They did. Yeah, but you got you got another problem there, James. Not just those two characters. You got the slight problem with something called the Home Office, which is about the most incompetent organisation on the planet. Oh, what a uh, time to be alive! Army. What a time to be alive! I mean, is there the vaguest chance that things are? I mean, even if success is not as amazing and as impressive as we might hope, that that, that, that a month from now we might all look back and go, "Cool, we dodged a bullet there." Good old Quasi Kwarteng. He, he did know what he was doing all along. Uh, I don't think it's guaranteed <laughs> to be a disaster. Right. I think it's guaranteed not to succeed. Very diplomatically put, albeit somewhat apocalyptically too. Thank you, Johnty. James is in Stamford in Lincoln. So, James, what would you like to say? James, I think um, I was just trying to try and work out exactly what you can see in the, the magic eye picture and what yeah. success looks like. And, and, after, and unfortunately, because we're not selfish individuals in the same way that there's trusses and her um, former Johnson are like, you, you won't get the true picture but i honestly believe that this is all to do with party funds to get her through an election because to her she's coming to a divided party they're all saying it's going to be short term her um, her position everything else but if you take her ultimate goal of just actually winning one election and therefore turn around to the party and say look mm. you know there you have it then she needs the funds to get the funds she needs the one percent of the population on her side that's going to be funding it, all the wealthy I, I, no, and I'm, therefore, I'm going to disagree yeah. with you I, I think I, I mean I see why the uh, what would you call it the um uh, the, the temptation to fit the fit the fit the theory to the facts and the evidence is compelling but why would that yeah. chief secretary to the treasury give away on Friday that they thought that the pound was going to go up I can't, yeah, I mean... That, <laughs> that's yeah, the, that's I why I keep I coming back to this joke. tweet, you see. Because, <laughs> I mean, either he is the stupidest man in stupid land, or, well, it's not either or, he's quite possibly both, or, or it, they just got it so horribly wrong that now they can't even begin to admit it. They can't even begin to admit how horribly wrong they've got it, and the clue that they thought it was going to go in the opposite direction is that tweet, not from some, you know, no Mark backbencher like, I, I, I don't know, Mark Francois or Andrew Bridgen, but from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, his fingerprints will be all over that budget, that mini-budget, won't they? And he thought it was going to go the other way. This bloke from the IEA speaking to the spectator about how the markets will be fine with it. We are, we well, are, we are I, currently I outperforming only the Madagascan something or other. I forget precisely what their uh, currency is called, the Varka mm. or something like that. I, I can't see any other explanation, sane explanation for why they're doing what they're doing if it's um, without a yeah, then we're back to the COVID. Then, yeah, but then we're back to COVID and we sat here for weeks thinking there must be some some explanation. There's no way we can make sense of what is going no, on here unless, you know, there is some sort of explanation that we can't currently 
perceive. And then it turns out those things really were as awful as we feared. There was there was a headless chicken in Downing Street running around randomly, or a, or a wonky shopping trolley has his own chief advisor, essentially called him. But hey, James, we will we will never stop trying to make sense of these scenarios. And I think you're right about personality types. You know, whether it's unselfishness or something less self-aggrandizing, you, you, you will never stop hoping that there is A, somebody sensible somewhere in the picture, and B, light at the end of the tunnel, because I think this does feel a little bit like the, the first month into COVID, when you suddenly thought they, they don't just not know what they're doing, they're insisting that they're playing a blinder. And right up until the end, Boris Johnson's acolytes were claiming he'd got all the big calls right. It's such a, a, a pant-wettingly stupid observation, and yet on they went. Are we here again? I do not know. 0345 606 is the number that you need. Um, the pound is currently, I think, performing worse than any other currency in the world, except the Madagascan something or other. Go on, give me the positive gloss on that. Talking the country down, blooming lefties. It's the opposite. When are people going to realise that? If an arsonist comes into your house and you kick his head in and chuck him out the back door... You are not talking your house down. You're getting rid of the arsonist. You're warning, but get out of the house. There's a bloke in the kitchen with a petrol bomb. Ah, oh dear. 10.46 is the time. 10 to 11 is the time. Labour Party's just announced that they will re-nationalise the railways. Um, I, but, 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 crucially, they will take them back into public ownership as contracts expire. So Keir Starmer's objection to that policy was always the fact that he'd have to do a quasi quarter and borrow billions of pounds to pay off the companies that currently own the railways. But given that they are franchises that expire, and the franchises are owned by the government, as it were, I think, um, then when the contracts expire, you can then have a nationalised replacement, which means any profits either go into the Treasury or go back into the railways, or possibly even into the pockets of the people who clean them, staff them, guard them, and drive them. Because... And again, to um, nod back towards Quasi Quateng on Friday, you can give me a ton of money, that's great, but not train drivers or, or train cleaners, train, train staff. That, that, that would cause inflation. 10.51 is the time. And that conclusion, that reluctant conclusion that they haven't got a clue, Johnsy's explanation in St John's Wood, that it, it, you can only understand this if you see it through an ideological lens. It's so true. You can only understand this if you see it as belief. Why would Kwarteng not let us see the Office for Budgetary Responsibilities forecasts? Because they are going to... It'd be like having a camera at the bottom of the garden where he thinks the fairies are. We can't have a camera there because the camera might actually record the fact that there aren't any fairies and then I wouldn't be able to tell everybody that there are fairies at the bottom of my garden. So don't let the light in, whatever you do, because they cling to the ideological belief. And the kindest thing I can say about them is that they seem to... Believe it. They do seem to honestly think. I don't think it's about smash and grab. I know Nick Abbott is developing the theory that they know they're going to lose the next election, and so they're just trying to transfer as much cash as they can for their sort of cronies and compadres. And it's a compelling theory. And I bow to a few broadcasters as, uh, as low as I bow to the, to the master that is Nick Abbott, but I, he's a more cynical man than me on this. I, I think they honestly believe it will, because otherwise... They, 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 there's no electoral or political sense to it. They think it will work. It almost certainly won't. And the fact that the pound's gone off a cliff when they were pretty confident that it wouldn't should be a cause for major alarm. But anyway, front page of the Daily Mail, Quasi's boost for families. Everything's great. Everything's great. David's in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. David, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello. Uh, good to speak with you. Um, so I, I think it's about moving the Overton window on taxation. So they know that there's going to be an election coming up very shortly. Right. They know that they're going to struggle to get anywhere in this election because of the terrible performance over the last 12 years. And I so didn't hold them back they, in 2019, 2017 or 2015. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, I, I would Really, the, 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 what I'm trying to get at here yeah. is that the... Um, They've set a trap for Labour. Yeah, basically. So which so Labour have dodged. Labor, well, Labour have got to say, haven't they, that they're going to put taxes up? No, they've said that they will, they'll um, restore the 45% tax rate for people like me, but they won't change the 20% cut down to 19%. That Starmer's sort of shot their fox. I think you're right. I think that was the fox. Yeah. Um, but it, it's uh, been shot. And, 
And so this is hence the announcement from um, Kwasi Gauteng over the weekend that he's going to announce more cuts in tax because he's got to push them so that they do say, "Hey, we've got to, we've got to put the taxes back uh, up because so then he'll keep, fiscally keep, responsible." Right. Okay. And and then just borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. I mean, it is it's almost like a reversal of the status quo. Remember that there are still people out there who refer to Liam Burns' note saying there isn't any money left, which is I, I, I discovered it's quite a well known tradition in, in, in the Treasury when one government is replaced by another. It, it, it had happened before on occasion. But, the you know, compared then to now, it's incredible that some people still think yeah. that's evidence of Labour's incompetence. I suppose if you get told something often enough, eventually you start you start believing it. But they're going to crash the economy in order to cast Labour as the party of high because, taxation. Because they, because they can't lose then. Because either oh, they, can. they then... Because well, Labour just turn around and say, they've the, done this. They've the, done this to you. What are you going to do? Look out of your window and see sort of a Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome scenario unfolding. There's right two across. possible outcomes, James. Yeah, go on. There's, there's, there's two possible outcomes. So one of them is they lose the election. Labour inherit a crashed economy. Oh, I see what and you mean. And then they will be, they'll be re, um, referring to them as the people who crashed the economy. Right. Um, or the, then the second option is they win the next election because of the Labour being the, the, yeah. the party of increased taxation. And then they... They've got however much time to try and fix it, and, know that, and then the storyline, of course, will be, well, we saved you from Labour. Yeah. So, so whatever it no, is... No, I like it. You're very, a very, very cynical man. You're a very cynical man. A cynical man, but I like you. Okay. Well, how, thank you very much. How is this sort of stuff being reported in the Netherlands, if at all? Um, I, I haven't, honestly, I haven't looked... No. Um, over the weekend, the, I've, I've been too busy over the weekend to do it, to, to look at that. But <laughs> how um, dare you not do your homework before <laughs> ringing me? How appalling! Back in class. It, it seems to be that the, they look at the UK right now with with trust and all that's going yeah. on there with puzzlement as much as anything. Well, what the hell's going on? You know? Yeah. Ariary. Uh, it's the Madagascan yeah. Ariary, David. That's the that's the one currency oh, okay. in the world that Bloomberg track that is currently performing better than the pound. The Ariary. Ariari? Ariary? Ariary? Ari- I don't know. Anyway, go them. It's a good place for a holiday. <sighs> Derek's in Leeds. Derek, what's going on? Um, well, the variation on the theme you just heard, as luck would have it, um, I don't think it's economic at all. I'm an ex-FD in local government, so oh, okay. I've got some background. Yeah. And um, I think what's happening is, Truss and Co., they're not worried about the last 12 years, they're worried about the last two years and the and the um, cheapening of the brand of the conservative brand that's that's existed under under Johnson. Now my my view is they know fine well what this will do. Yeah. They know fine well it's a very small percentage chance of doing any good, other than helping their electoral chance. It will solidify their base and it will attract back some of the. Brexit people are a bit disenchanted. But we, how is it? How that. is it going to solidify that? Or are you suggesting that's what their calculation is, not what's likely to that's actually their happen? Calculation. I mean, right. they've already test test run the, the theory. They've already done the you know the the uh, information on the Hustings said it. Mm. It went down like a bomb by saying the two t- tax reductions. Mm. And and the other thing is, there's a lot of disenchanted Brexit people. I hate Brexit as much as I think you do. Yes. And. <laughs> And and those people will get attracted back because just think of how they've sold Brexit since since it's become readily apparent it's the biggest nightmare we've ever had financially. Yeah, self inflicted And and what they've done is kept saying, Oh well it's not quite there yet. Yeah. It'll be there soon. Yeah. And that's what they'll do with this. Oh well it's longer term, you know. We haven't had a but real one now. yet. There's a bloke in the telegraph who writes an article every year, every time there's a new prime minister who goes, This time this time, we're, oh, we're going to get the Brexit we deserve. Good old Theresa's going to finally bring back the Brexit bacon. That's good it. old good old Boris is going to finally bring back the Brexit bacon. Good old Liz Truss is going to finally bring... Do you think they'll ever run out of bacon? No. No. So, but, but seriously, they might run out of credibility, hopefully. But seriously, James, what yes. they'll add on to that, what you'll see in that writer's column soon, is maybe this time it'll be Brexit and growth. Maybe the growth will start to come now from the investment we made two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I just think it, about what Labour do. It's all pie Nothing in the sky. No, I hear you. There's a former minister who's spoken to Sky News, unidentified, conservative former minister. <laughs> There's so many asterisks in this quote that I can't, 
I can only speculate about what the word Liz is something. She is swear word. She's taking on markets and the Bank of England. Her quasi, Philp, S- mm. Simon Clark probably are playing A level economics with people's lives. MPs are already putting letters in as she yeah. will crash yeah. the economy. Yeah, well, she's, a st- she's not a stalking horse, but she's a temporary f- phenomenon, isn't she? They won't go to the country in two years, we trust. They just won't. She's unpopular anyway. She's an absolute idiot, I think, most, <laughs> most thinking people think. She changes her mind every Hang on, she's seconds. a famous daughter. She's a doughty daughter of Leeds, Derek. How can no, you be? No, she's not. Oh, no. she's not. She, came here, she came here in her adolescence. She, she, did, she wasn't born here. She was younger she's than She's one of us. No, I know. If she was, the, somebody would shoot her. Round, no, 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 no. We know, no. I know that that's a figure of speech, but, but, but we certainly don't ever go down those sort of roads or those sort of paths. Round hay. Not being quite the the ghetto that Liz Truss sought to um to compare to, to compare it as I won't I won't I, I, I know it's sometimes a rush of blood to the head when you're live on the radio but I won't have that sort of language. Thank you, Derek. Uh, it's coming up to eleven o'clock. Rishi Sunak during that election campaign that Derek speaks of, so telling us what would happen to well what would happen in the event of policies like quasi quartings being introduced. He said there will be a run on sterling, the gilts market will be in free fall and the FTSE will tumble as global investors take fright and sell off every form of British asset. It might take only a few days or the government might stagger through until the end of September. But long before Liz Twas and quasi Quarteng will have been forced to call in the IMF. Four minutes after 11 is the time, and with the sort of fleetness of foot that you can only find on LBC, um, I think we'll dedicate the next hour to a story that has only just unfolded or indeed emerged. I, I speak of the announcement in the last few minutes that Labour will renationalise the railways. Just pause, listen to those words, and tell me what you think. Labour is to renationalise the railways, not in a, um, a sort of ludicrous way. Oh, not ludicrous, but in a sort of idealistic way by sort of just buying them all back from the companies that currently control them, but by taking them over, having a nationalised service taking over rail services as and when their current contracts expire. I mean, the crazy thing is about this country at the moment is that they've done that already. Previous governments, conservative governments have done that, but only when the private companies that had bid for the franchises didn't make as much profit as they were expecting to. They've sort of handed the keys back to the government. And then when things are back on an even keel, the government gives the keys back to another private company to try and make some moolah out of the services. I say stuff like that out loud. And again, I I find myself thinking, no, that can't be right. You must have got the wrong end of the stick on that one. But it has definitely happened. Um, And... And there it is. I, I mean, the, the idea that this will be a vote winner or a vote loser or a vote uh, inspirer of ambivalence, I, I, I do not know. I love it. I, I'm getting more... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? More public-spirited as I get older? I, I'm more convinced that prioritising companies, prioritising businesses and profits and shareholders and dividends, which is, if you like, the definition of what some people like to call neoliberalism, is responsible for for almost all of our disasters. The way that this country has seen um, other governments, foreign governments, take huge stakes in our essential services and utilities is incredible because it means we're supremely comfortable with the idea of state-owned railways or state-owned utility companies, it's just foreign states that we encourage to buy into our water services or our railway services. Just, I, I think that is really worth pausing on for a moment. Because if you think that you are politically opposed to nationalisation, politi- then you think that you are politically opposed to governments owning utilities and services and running them, then you are, I'm afraid, upside down. You are living in a country where it routinely and regularly happens. I think the Chinese government's got a piece of the action, hasn't it? Certainly on the nuclear side of things. The French government on our railways, there was a brilliant little promotional advert put out by the Transport and Salary, the TSSA union, which had, it was mocked up, actually. I was able to identify that it was mocked up because the Dutch contributor to it, I recognised the canal he was walking by. It was actually in Brentford. So he wasn't actually in Amsterdam at all. He was in Brentford. That's the sort of Sherlocking that you tune in for every day. However, the point was that we get cheaper railways because our governments own yours. 
The French do it. The, the, the Dutch did it. The Germans, I think, have got a piece. And that's just incredible, right? We've nationalised the railways just for other nations. I don't think I can stress this point enough. Seven minutes after 11 is the time. So here it is. Um, the fragmented and privatised model is letting down the British people. The shadow rail minister, Tanmanji Desi, has told conference, told the BBC this, this morning. Keir Starmer said he would be taking a pragmatic but not ideological approach to nationalisation. Um, and, and I like it. I, I, think, I think Louise Haig has just done it in conference as well. This is, this is, this is overnight to the BBC. I, I like that. I think that is, is Keir Starmer, who is going to struggle to reach the people in this country when you look at the gatekeeping that is done by the Tory press. I and mean, it, is, it is off the scale now. It's by far the worst it's ever been in my lifetime. It's worse than it was in many ways in the run-up to Brexit. But on we go. The Daily Mail and the Daily Express today completely ignoring or describing as market jitters movements in the pound that have seen it reach its lowest level ever against the dollar. But you have a, um, a leader in Sir Keir Starmer who, when he says he would take a pragmatic, not ideological approach, is distinguishing himself both from the Conservatives and from his predecessor, who, of course, continues to spook huge swathes of the electorate. And that's not an opinion, that's just counting. I'm sorry if you're still unhappy about that simple fact, but the worst election result since 1935... Um, was, well, yeah, it was down to people voting. <laughs> a Labour government will bring the railways back into public ownership, Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Haig has just said. Speaking to party members at the conference in Liverpool, she told delegates, we will cast aside the tired dogma that has failed passengers. We will improve services and lower fares. This is a really big deal. And, and this is the first big scoop, the first big policy pronouncement to come out of the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. I like it for two reasons. Reason number one, I don't buy the idea that despite, you know, the 1970s and the spectre of British Leyland and British Rail, I don't buy the idea that governments can't provide effective services in these sort of contexts for the very simple reason that other governments do. And therefore, the British government should be able to as well. And the second reason I like this idea is because the model of squeezing everything in order to enrich shareholders and investors, is responsible for I, I, I mean, almost all of the problems that we have on, on one scale or another, whether it is a magnifying glass, whether it's a catalyst, whether it's exacerbated the problem or even caused it in the first place. Look at the water companies. If you look at the amount of money that water companies have both borrowed and paid out in dividends to shareholders, you will no longer wonder how you've ended up living in a country where shocking amounts of sewage are routinely pumped into our waterways. It is as simple as night following day. If you have companies run for profit, prioritised for profit above everything else, above staff wages, above research and development, above quality of service, if you can get your hands on a monopoly... If you can get your hands on a water company or a railway, then you can squeeze those udders until your pockets are full. You can rinse the consumer until you can't even hear the pips squeaking anymore. And I believe that has happened. I think it's happened more obviously with utilities, most obviously with water and latterly with energy. But I also believe that it's happened on the railways. Um, what do you make of this? If you work on the railways, maybe you want to sound a voice of caution. You want to say, James, don't get too excited too quickly. It could all go horribly wrong. If you can remember the 1970s, uh, then perhaps you want to sound a voice of caution. But don't forget that Arriva is owned, I think, by the German government, or at least in large part by the German government. So you are not, even if you've been persuaded that you are, you are not actually opposed to the state ownership of railways because you've been sitting comfortably for years while foreign governments have bought up huge swathes of our national infrastructure in this country. So if you work on the railways, just give us an idea about what this is going to mean, what it's going to look like. And then crucially, crucially, as a voter... Does this move your needle? Perhaps you were unimpressed by Keir Starmer because you retain a, a, a deep attachment to the last Labour leader, to Jeremy Corbyn, and, and you feel that the programmes of nationalisation that he talked about, arguably in a slightly more idealistic rather than pragmatic way, but you feel that Starmer wasn't going to grasp those particular nettles. Does the fact that he is grasping it 
move your needle at all? Does it turn your dial? And what about those fascinating voters, the most interesting voters of all, the most important voters of all, who can uh, reasonably conceive of voting in all manner of different ways at an election? People who, who perhaps have put crosses in all sorts of boxes over the years and who thought maybe 10 years ago that nationalisation was one step away from communism. I love, as you know, the idea and the reality of mind changing, of needle nudging politics. People who are open minded enough to acknowledge that actually I might have a scarf of a certain colour around my neck but thankfully it's not knotted so tightly that I can't get it off. I can see that at this point, in this cycle, I don't think I'm going to become a, a lifelong Labour voter, but look at the red wall at the last election. Lifelong Labour voters turned out for the Conservatives in unprecedented numbers. Is there any sign in this announcement about nationalising railways that you may actually be moved back in that direction, back in the Labour direction? Because nationalising the railways is a big policy. And it is precisely the sort of thing that many people, perhaps even myself included, many people thought that Keir Starmer would be a little bit too worried about scaring the horses. Because remember, if you own a newspaper, you own a ton of shares in a ton of different companies. And, and, and if you're going to do something that takes away these cash cows from these plutocrats, from these barons, these media barons, you're going to do something that takes away the cash cows, they will come for you. You know, that, that's, that's just obvious. That's, that's, that's media 101. You damage the financial interests of the richest people in the country, they will use the media that they own to attack you. Okay, that's how it works. Starmer here is, is taking the fight, I think, to them. And he is saying the railways belong in the hands of the people. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. The Labour Party is to, is to nationalise... The railways. They are bringing the railways back into public ownership. What does that mean? If you are qualified to comment on the on the sector, on the industry, on the policy, and what does it mean for you as a voter, which everybody is qualified to answer, even me? It's coming up to quarter past eleven. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The numbers you need: oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. And if you hit them now, you will get through. 18 minutes after 11 is the time, and you are indeed listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we are discussing for the first time in a while, given electoral cycles, uh, a major policy proposal from a Labour opposition currently riding very high in the opinion polls. So what do you think this particular announcement will do to those poll numbers? A Labour government will bring the railways back into public ownership, Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Haig has said. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. Dan's in Finchley. Dan, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Oh. I think um, one thing I'd just like to point out with the, the railway privatisation is... Nationalisation. You know, you, you, nationalisation, sorry. If you talk <laughs> about the the uh, franchises and the need for those to expire, you know, in order to take mm. those back. And what I'd be really keen to see is it's all the other elements of the, the, the current railway setup that suck money out at every different level of it. So to give you an example, you know, the RMT report for it was an rmt report um just after the pandemic which showed that the so you've got the the train operating companies like you know the ones that run the actual trains virgin trains all the logos we see they obviously take some money out of the railways you've then got below them you've got what are called the um, rolling stock companies so they took in the pandemic year a billion pounds in dividends Sheesh. out of the railways and mm. all that and this is the rmt um there's an RMT report yeah. on this yeah and that's just, and that's, you know, all these companies are doing, they, they for example, bought or were given knockdown prices, British rail stock mm. in the 1990s. A lot of them effectively took that over. They lease it back into the railways. Um, you know, so what I'd be interested to see on Labour's proposition is, you know, A, yes, does it cover those franchises? Does it also cover then the rolling stock companies, as I've mentioned? Yeah, I, well, all, hang on. You know, I mean, give them a chance, mate. They only announced it 10 yeah, minutes ago and, and they, know, will be, they will be well aware of what you, uh, uh, what you describe. And, and one imagines that it will be part of the proposal, part of their, their to-do list. I, I don't know whether or not the contracts expire on the rolling stock and some of the other um, uh, uh, bits that you mentioned. But, but you sense, don't you, that this is... Uh, quite old school labour, which means it will be in hand in hand with the trade unions, which means that probably these issues will be addressed. 
I, I'd hope so. It'd just be good to see the, the details of it. I always get you know suspicious, e- even with say Network Rail, which mm. is a national. That is company, already nationalised, isn't it? It, it is, but 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 again, from the RMT's, you know, looking at the RMT reports, there's a lot. You know, there's a lot of money that Network Network Rail does a lot of outsourcing of you know of work yeah. and labour. You know, so it's just ensuring that nationalisation means nationalisation well, and not. Yeah, although I, I'm going to take this from Heather on trust. I've got no reason to doubt it. Um, you know, just simply looking at changing ownership with all of the other stuff you described being put on hold for the time being, it's still progress. So you've got cross-country rails, German state, East Midlands, Dutch state, Eurostar, French state, Gatwick Express, French state, Grand Central, German state, Great Northern, French state, GWR private. I don't know quite what that means. Oh, just as in no no, no government ownership. No There's a long state. list here of, of the Dutch, the Germans in particular, um, having a fairly big slice... Oh yeah, of the action. Footprint. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so there, just there even a... just swapping that in the first instance, just saying, actually, no, not anymore, lads. Um, we're having it. Yeah, absolutely. It would be it would be perfect. So, but I, you know, I think it's it's then making sure that you know, because if you, I mean, the numbers, you just think, as you say, that's that's obviously important that the state bit, but just as context, you yeah. know, like fair, fares in the fa- in the and admittedly it's the COVID pandemic year, but the total p- passions of revenue was one point nine billion. So if you think a billion quid mm. is just dividends, these kind of hidden train operating company, uh, rolling stock companies, it's just the context of the numbers flying around. Um, I, I agree. It would be great, you know, st- stage one, if we could go and let the franchises roll. But it's just making sure that it's all ra- It's not just. Yes, of yeah, course. Not, not just you know, all, all, all headline, no story. And, and uh, I mean, again, I think with, it, with, with the, the stuff that they're often criticised for, or that Starmer in particular is often criticised for, and Rachel Reeves, actually, the shadow chancellor of being a bit plodding, perhaps, or a bit dull. Those are reasons to be cheerful when it comes to wanting detail and, and delivery as opposed to fireworks and, um, and, and excitement. 22 minutes after 11 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the news that the Labour Party, if it is to be elected, will renationalise the railways is, is being examined by all of us. But remember, you can come at it from e- either angle, either from knowledge of the sector and what it might mean, what, what, what you think of it, right through to, I'm just a voter, standing in front of... Of a, of a ballot box asking it to love me. No, asking how am I going to vote in this election? Does renationalising the railways move your... Does it nudge your needle? That's the phrase I've settled upon. Nudge your needle. Does it nudge your needle in any way? 03456060973. Um, will you mention Scott Rail? Or is this discussion only about England? Oh, there you go, I mentioned it. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the score is in Scotland. I'm constantly surprised by how different things are in different parts of the United Kingdom post devolution. So uh, I, uh, back to back to school on that one. With my apologies, Chris is in Carlisle. Chris, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, I just wanted to talk because um, I'm someone who works on the railways for Network Rail, so I'll yeah. disclose that before I start. Of course. Um, <laughs> it's just that I, I do believe it's a good idea, and I do believe that it's long overdue. And if you look at polling, I think the majority of the public have supported it. For I, you, how far the polls go back? Yeah, they have. I don't, I've never, and that's even conservative voters mm. as well, because I'm sure they divided it highly loyalty in conservatives. Yes. Voters wanted nationalisation, but, you know, we have a party that in power that tell us our state can't run anything, but they're happy to let the rest of I mean, the big it, it, nasty it, it, EU states run it. It, it is <laughs> that simple, isn't it? I'm not, I'm not, I mean, not, I mean, I'm not exaggerating or, or, or embellishing that they are supremely comfortable with governments owning railways and utilities, just not their own government. Yeah, it's, it's 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 madness, and and I, 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 again we fall for it. Well, I don't. I say the proverbial we, but the country <laughs> when it goes to the polls, fall for these lies. But, enough um, people, enough people. Yeah. So those who thought, <laughs> um, and it feels very depressing, doesn't it, all the time with everything that's going on. We've got a lot of years to wait till we can hopefully change it. But going back to the real ways. Yeah. Um, Dan picked on, I think he was called Dan, your previous yeah. caller, he mentioned the role in stocks. That was what I was going to talk about, which we sort of stole the thunder, is that for us to take back ownership of the actual trains themselves, not just the names that's on the trains, yeah. would cost us billions. So we will have to look at the detail of that, because that's where a lot of money goes to these you know, hedge funds and, again, different European countries that own our rolling stock. And to actually buy them back... Because they actually own them, so it wouldn't be a case of the contract expiring. It'd be no. a case of us having to physically buy them back off them. So the other option is we just start building our own trains 
and just you know as time goes on we'll slowly have our own government owned stock and and when people refer back to i mean i'm not old enough thankfully to have been alive we could do a form of compulsory I purchase could, I, I suppose we could yeah. but i mean we're, 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 yeah. we're stretching a bit oh, you know. yeah well we could pressure them to you know lower the rates so we're not paying too mm-hmm. much in rent mm-hmm. again we could say right if you don't lower them we're going to build our own and you just can sod off so to speak yeah no fair <laughs> enough but um when people talk about like um the 80s and 70s they have to look what the government actually did were they investing in the railways because a big thing is when this money goes into the treasury is making sure the treasury keep up and modernizing the railways so it doesn't all just say right we keep the money for ourselves and we'll spend it on other things and then we'll run down the railways to justify saying it's all terrible we need to get the privateers in to sort it out and on the staff side because obviously i work with people that have been on the railway a long time yes under British Railways, um, the, the wages were really poor. They had to do a lot of different, like, overtime and different things to, to bump up their salary. So it's just making sure that if it does go back into government control, and I have no doubt under a Labour government, which are meant to be the party for workers, mm. that they would look after wages. But that's just one thing to watch again as well, that a lot of workers actually did rather well out of privatisation because the wages have rose. And that's thanks to powerful unions, you know, fighting hard for the members. But they did really well out of privatising in terms of wages okay. increased massively. So oh, I didn't just, know that. Oh, yeah, and obviously we want everyone's wages to go up. It's not just about railway workers. But it's just, and, and again, you mentioned the cleaners as well. It's bringing them back in-house because a lot of them are outsourced to... It is, I mean, I, I'm always wary of symbolism or, or of oversimplifying things. But I, I, do, I do feel, listening to people like you, that the... I mean, just the very, very simple ideological movement of the last 30 years has been to believe, as you've just alluded to, that if you put it in the private sector and and, and the people running it can keep the profits, that they will somehow provide a better service. And the reality is the opposite. We've all experienced, or if not the opposite, then it's simply not been borne out by events, has it? From from sewage in the waterways to, to, to chaos on the railways. Exactly. And these companies as well, if there's no competition, so if, we, if you live in Barrow and Furness, you can literally take a Northern Rail train. You can't take another. There's no other company. So mm. you are tied to one company. Same with water. We're tied to one company. There's no competition. So you have to so open So it's not genuine privatisation. No, the, the, the reason no. they give you for privatising things has, has not been delivered, have not and, been borne out by reality. Against. Yeah, I'm not against privatisation in the sense of as long as there's competition, fair competition that drives down prices for the consumers. So if if we, you know, we've got, so we we end up with the worst of just the, a monopoly. Yeah, we get the worst of both worlds, don't we? Where you you you, pri- yeah. you privatise the profits and socialise the risk. Well, that's the famous saying, isn't it? We'll it will nationalise the losses, we'll privatise the profits. There isn't it is, it? and that's, sure. where, that's where we are. I like there it. So are. a cautious welcome from it. Carlisle. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Stay safe. 28 minutes after 11. Um, Grace in Lanark tells me that Scotland nationalised um, April the 22nd, ScotRail. Um, I, I, I mean, there you go. Another model, perhaps, where England can follow in the steps of, of devolved Scotland. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, we haven't had votes yet, political responses, as opposed to um, industry-based responses. There's room for both. 0345 6060973. A couple of texts at the very top. One chap, and, I, and you'll understand my inbox moves so quickly, I can not I can very rarely keep track of these things. But if you are the rather charming chap who sent me a picture of his screen saying, it's the only time I've ever been qualified to comment, and he sent me a picture of his phone screen saying that they, were, they couldn't get through. You will get through now. If you're very, very quick, you can grab a phone line on 0345 973 Obviously, it warms the cockles of my heart to see those screens where, where it says... Because there's God knows how many lines into the building, certainly into double figures. And if, if they're all full, that's when you will get the uh, the busy message or the busy signal. But but you should be able to grab um, grab one now if you're quick. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. Holly Harris is here with your headlines. 33 minutes after 11 is the time. And there it is. Labour will renationalise the railways. Um, and we've already identified some potential problems with that but the ideological one doesn't hold water anymore uh, because you have sat by comfortably while foreign governments have bought up huge swathes of our infrastructure our utilities and indeed our railways so you are not uncomfortable with the idea of governments owning railways it's just that our own government unless you're in scotland or wales uh, has not had a piece of the action and still may not unless the labour party win the next election which brings me to my second question which is does what does this do to you politically I, I, it's, it's an interesting one isn't it because I don't know how many people 
who remain uh, fond of the last Labour leader, fond of Jeremy Corbyn, are prepared to do what a lot of us did at the last election, a lot of us who were not impressed by Jeremy Corbyn, who knew what was going to happen probably in that 2019 result, but you, you sort of held your nose about the leadership and voted for the party anyway because the alternative was Boris Johnson's Conservatives. I don't know how many people in that category there, the sort of Corbyn, uh, continuity Corbyn, were planning to hold their nose and vote for Keir Starmer even if they don't like him. But if you were in that category, does this put you in a slightly warmer frame of mind? Will you, will you only have to cover one nostril? as you make your way into the ballot box. I don't know. I'm just interested in, in whether it's nudged your needle. Gerald's in Glasgow. Gerald, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How's it going? Very well, mate. What's on your mind? I just find it curious, um, in a situation like we have now, in, in a post-Brexit Britain, where there's been an entire political movement based around bringing things back within our borders, taking yeah. control back, keeping out the dirty foreign horde from interest in our industry and our business, why there wouldn't be more people proud of the fact that we have people standing up and saying, yes, let's let's nationalise something, let's have British interests for British industry. Um, I find it curious when it comes to people who maybe did vote for Brexit are consistently voting Conservative despite the situations of what's going on in the country to go, I think- oh no, though, that's... That's, that's going in the wrong way. I, it's, uh, I don't know why I just said I. I never say I. I'm getting it's all some Scottish by osmosis there. I just, uh, it's like when I say grand to my Irish callers. I've, I've got this tense yeah, because I'm a people pleaser. But I did just say I to you, Gerald. So <laughs> that, that, that don't means, patronize uh, me, Jim. Exactly. That's what I, it's precisely what I mean. I am just sort of low level, <laughs> gentle, but unintentional patronizing. My apologies. Um, that's the point, though, isn't it? This, this, this is the spell, if you like, that. Um, that Starmer has to break. People who think that they are ideologically aligned with both Brexit and privatisation logically can't be both. I mean, if, if, you, mm-hmm. if you do have that patriotic swell about the notion of taking back control, then you should love the idea of the British government taking back control of British railways from foreign governments. <laughs> Isn't it? I wonder, though... Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, I, I wonder what... It- kind of mental gymnastics you have to do I don't know in this situation it's uh, my life's work studying these people in many ways <laughs> although I, I get I get fewer volunteers for the for the sort of intellectual vivisection that we used to conduct on the program every day but I'm still fascinated by it it's footballification partly psychologically they just think that that's their team even as their team leads them into ever darker uh, places they still think that they're, and then of course there's the satisfaction that oh it's upset the lefties therefore I must like it I don't know where that comes from. That's one of the hardest things to uh, to pin down. But I, what do you reckon? Do you reckon electorally this will reach parts that other policies have failed to reach? Uh, I mean, given the outcomes of the last few elections, mm. I genuinely believe, you know, what, what would it actually take to shift the Conservatives out of Westminster? We've talked about election after election after election, like, oh, well, this is the time. I mean, it couldn't possibly get worse than this. There's nothing that they could possibly do that would be worse than what they've currently done. I mean, people will just wake up and go like, enough's enough, obviously. I mean, I wonder, does Liz Truss have to go on national television with a dog and a gun? I'm about to do something unthinkable on British shoot the dog television. For some people not, yeah. not following your, your imagery. Yeah. It's Donald Trump territory, isn't it, I suppose? And yeah. Except with him... It was it was it was unique to him. Whereas what we've seen with Johnson is that Trust thinks that she can somehow return. I'm not sure she can. I've got to be honest with you. The way Conservative MPs are already talking is surely going to be echoed across the country. The political correspondent, The Guardian, has another quote from a Tory MP um, talking of no confidence letters going in already. My colleagues will rule nothing in and nothing out. There will come a time when people say have to say, "I know it'll make us look chaotic, but we can't go on like this." Um, and, and, you know, the public, surely, if, if, if MPs can have the spell broken for them by events, then surely significant sways of the public can as well. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, my apologies once again for patronising you. Uh, Donald is in Walsall. Donald, what would you like to say? Um, hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, Hello, yeah, Donald. what I'd like to say, hi. Um, I travel from Walsall to London, and it is 
so expensive. I work a lot from home. I'm a welfare benefits advisor. And, right. you know, fortunately, I, I don't have to get a train every day. Yeah. But I try to find tickets. And sometimes they're quoting £100 for a return journey. Yeah. And I have to book months in advance. And I believe that because of the way that the trains are funded and managed and own the ownership of them is because that's why we're paying so much. And I think that the public have to wake up and and get a change because we cannot have you know, trains being um, owned by foreign companies who are just there to make profit. They're laughing at us. They are, they're aren't they? They, are, they must they are, be. They're laugh- they are. Because why would you... If, I, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm a Dutch politician... Why on earth would I care about you? Of course they don't. They don't. They In laugh, Warsaw. They laugh at us. Well, I don't know. No, maybe they don't. We've been, they're not laughing at us, but, but I mean, maybe they are, but we don't know. But what I mean is, if, if I'm a British politician and I own the railways, my government owns the ra- the country, the, the, then, then there is a relationship there that is yes, both political, it's political and it's, it's behavioural. I, I care yeah. because if the railways are well run and you know that we're running them, you're more likely to vote for me. Of course. Why and, would a Dutch politician give a monkeys about your experiences they, on the railways in Walsall? They don't. No. Well, they don't. Well, there they it don't. is. Of course they don't. And, and that's why they need to get um, these industries, to get these um, basic industries back into ownership of this country because we are struggling. We are struggling. As I said, I work with people on the front line Clearly, yes. who have not got a penny 73 pounds a week to live on. They can't afford to get trains. Mm. They can't afford to get on the even get on the buses sometimes to get to their to their, their appointments. This has to change. You know, this pandemic that came up and if we had ownership, we would not have had all this money being sent out to these um, holders or whatever, whoever owns these companies, making all this profit and this um, this all this um, thing with the energy prices would not have happened well it would have could have happened but not as bad as it did no there's a, there's a global a en- there's a global energy crisis which yes. is wor- worse here than almost anywhere else because of decisions of that have been taken and policies that have been adopted right up yes. to today when liz truss is still refusing to impose a windfall tax on the energy companies which she could then d- divvy up among among bill payers, among voters. I mean, it, it, it is doable. It has been done elsewhere. And the reason she gave for not doing it has been shot down by one of the fellas that runs BP or Shell. I forget which one it was, who said it's simply not true that we would reduce investment if uh, if a windfall tax was introduced. Thank you, Donald. Uh, so is it going to nudge your needle electorally? 100%. Oh. Because I voted, I voted um, Lib Dem because I was disillusioned with Kerry Cor- Corbyn and yeah, sure. all, the, all the rubbish that was being spoke by him. But... Definitely, this is what I want to hear. And I think Keir Starmer needs to be more vocal. Mm. He needs to get his act together. And this is possibly the start of it. And I think if he does that, then more people will vote Labour. Definitely. There is a there is an air, an upbeat air in Liverpool. Theo, not just because Theo Oshawa is there entertaining everybody with his inimitable charms. But, um, but of course, everybody remembers Neil Kinnock. Any, anybody who leans towards... The, uh, the the more redistributive side of British politics, uh, it, very very wary of triumphalism or even optimism, when it comes to general elections, because the ghost of of, of Neil Kinnock, the probably one of the best prime ministers we never had, uh, certainly him and and the late John Smith, um, thinking that they'd got it over the line. Kinnock thought he'd got it over the line, and he hadn't. Eleven forty three is the time from Walsall to Basingstoke. Michael, what would you like to say? Um, I just wanted to clarify something. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, nationalising uh, railways, etc. Yes. Um, and one of your uh, listeners was talking about the co- the huge cost of buying the rolling stock, etc. Yeah. Uh, most of the, well, all of the rolling stock is actually leased. Nobody buys anything because... Um, but like, someone has uh, to own it, don't they? Y- Yes, the banks own it. Oh, I see. Or, or, or the leasing the leasing companies own it. And in fact, during the, the recent um, COVID and strikes, etc., yes. the um, the people who leased the, the the rolling stock made a fortune still because they still had to pay the rent for the the rolling stock. Oh, blimey! Whereas if it was nationalised, then you'd just stick it all on hold, wouldn't you? Until people start paying the well, paying well, the fare. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't put it on hold, but you wouldn't have the upfront cost of buying it in the first place. No, that's kind of what I meant. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, the, 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 
because it's yours, as it were. Well, no, it belongs to a bank or a... No, a... But, but if they... No, sorry, I'm, I'm imagining a world in which they would nationalise that as well. Oh, no, no. You, you did, why would you do that? Because I worked in the airline industry and airlines don't own the aeroplanes. They, they lease the engines, they lease the undercarriage. But, so, the, but uh, the reason would be the same, wouldn't it? Because someone's making a profit at every junction, at every turn. Yeah, but you're only paying, you paying rent, and I don't know whether it's an annual rent or a weekly rent, I'm not an expert, mm. but, but you're only, you haven't got that huge upfront cost. Of, um, no, I see what you mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so someone else does that. Someone else takes the the, the 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 actual capital. It's like a mortgage, isn't it? It's the deposit that people can't raise. They might have enough to make the monthly payments, but they just can't raise the the lump sum. Uh, you still need to pay the loan used to build the rolling stock, no matter how it was financed. Comes in one text, and uh, does John says, did anyone think that Donald said Warsaw? before realising a little later in the call that it was Walsall. I was sitting here thinking, crikey, that's a long train journey. 11.49 is the time. Um, it's funny, I've got some screens in front of me. Ken Clark is in one television studio, giving his thoughts, no doubt, on this pound falling to a record low, while Ed Miliband is on another screen, delivering his speech to Labour Conference, the Shadow Energy and Climate Change Secretary. You'll be unsurprised to learn that Ed Miliband looks a lot more animated than Ken Clark, but I'm very interested to hear what both of them have said. It was indeed at conference that uh, a little earlier today the Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Haig announced that Labour would be renationalising the railways, which is what we are currently discussing. Although not for the next few minutes, because I, I felt after the first hour of the programme that we were in need of some expert counsel.